This is Jason DeBoard from the Original Prop Blog. Today we're going to do a quick preview for the upcoming Eubanks auction on November 15th for the Prop Masters 30th anniversary auction. So I'm friends with David Oliver from Prop Masters. I've known him for many years. He was nice enough to send me a hard copy version of the auction catalog. So I thought we'd take a quick look at it. I haven't opened it yet. This is going to be my own first look. It looks a little bit... Um, beat up, to be honest with you. That's courtesy of the post office, um, but it did make it here. So it's got Darth Vader's helmet on the cover. I'm not exactly sure what that's about just because I haven't had time to look into this auction specifically yet. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, so let's, let's crack this open and take a look here. So um, we've got some information here. It looks like there's a viewing opportunity if you're in the UK, you're close to the auction house, you can go check out the items before you bid on them, which is something I always recommend to people if they do happen to have that opportunity. Um, it talks here about the buyer's premium and VAT, which is something that's charged um, basically in the UK. Sometimes when you're a buyer outside of the UK, you can get that refunded. So I would inquire with the auction house exactly how this um, fits your personal situation, where you're going to be bidding from, where you reside, if it's applicable, if there's ways to legitimately get around this, how do you do that? Um, but it looks like maybe the buyer's premium is 20% and then buyer's premium with VAT is 27%. But I'm looking at this for the first time. So definitely check that out. Look, look at that in some more detail. So it looks like we've got a letter here from David Oliver. You know, he's been involved in this field for a very long time. You know, um, I haven't read this yet, but he's talking about his childhood. And, um, you know, it says here, all lots come with the Prop Master Certificate of Authenticity. And as readers, longtime readers of the original Prop blog know, um, there's a lot of problems with COAs that are not worth anything and, and are misleading and are just not good. But this is one circumstance where it's actually a good thing. Um, David is a collector himself. I know he takes great pride in authenticating his material and, and researching and make sure, making sure things are, are legitimate and, and are what they are purported to be. So that's a good thing. I would also um, highlight that if there's a lot you're interested in, I believe David would probably be happy to um, have a dialogue with you about it, email exchange, whatever, if you have more questions about something you're interested in. He's very nice, very approachable, very professional. So I would um, take that opportunity if, if you're planning to participate in this auction. So then we just get into the catalog here. It looks really nice. It's got big, um, big, photo big photos, nice clean layout, black background, white background. Um, you know, it looks, it looks really nice. The descriptions aren't super long. So yeah, it looks really nice, really nice photography, a lot of items, um, really nice looking catalog. And we're going to go through this in more detail on via the online version. And there's a full list of terms in the back. I always highly recommend people actually read this stuff as, as intimidating as, and as boring as it might look, because sometimes there's terms that you might not expect, or there's changes, um, even with auction houses you've dealt with before. So it's important to always take a look at that. Um, there's information about the auctioneer here, where they're located, and that's pretty much it. So um, next we'll delve into the online version and do a quick run through and um, we'll go from there. 
So I wanted to take a quick look at the official Eubanks website to see how this auction is set up for um, people who are interested in the items, interested in bidding. It's a typical sort of auction interface. There's pages listing each lot. So if you click on one of the lots, it'll take you to a page with more information, the auction description, a link for a condition report, the estimate and a place to log in and register to bid. And then you can also click and see um, larger versions of the images. And if you go back to the main page here, up at the top, there's a link, there's a download link where you can um, download the PDF version of the printed catalog that we just looked at. So I went ahead and did that just before starting this video. So as you can see, it's it's basically identical to the printed catalog. It's just in PDF format. It's 188 pages. So we'll just quickly, quickly scroll through here and just take a look at, at um, the catalog and see if anything jumps out at us. So that's pretty cool. There's stuff from the 60s here, like this. Um, I don't know what this is. It looks sort of retro futuristic. It's from Our Man Flint from 1966. But there's just a lot of material in this auction. So we're just going to quickly go through here. That's Benny Hill, A Man for All Seasons, Fahrenheit 451, The Black Hole. Doctor Who, Jerry Anderson. Seems somewhat chronological. We're getting into the 70s now, like Blake 7. Definitely stuff for every budget. And there's, interestingly, there's, there's obscure things from properties I've never heard of, but I know in my own taste, there's things I like from my childhood. And I mentioned to people that have no idea what I'm talking about. So it's cool that people like David Oliver were out there saving this stuff because if people like him weren't out there, the, it wouldn't exist anymore. It would have just been thrown out. So um, this is interesting. It's an, it's an Imperial cloak from Star Wars um, from the costumer and the estimates only 800 to 1200 pounds. So, you know, the fact that you can potentially get something from the very first Star Wars film in 1977, for under $2,000, potentially, is pretty awesome. The Muppet Show. thats I still have nightmares from that from when I was a kid. <laughs> but there's some blueprints there, which is pretty cool. So this is the cover piece. It's a Darth Vader helmet. And I didn't really know anything about this coming into this, so I'm interested to read the description. So it says, um, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. A production made Darth Vader helmet constructed constructed within the production interim of Star Wars A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. The helmet is believed to be a transitional test production piece with production tells of both the A New Hope and Empire screen used helmets, not intended for screen use but departmental reference. Constructed of fiberglass, the chin on the faceplate still features the small triangular cutout unique to the A New Hope style helmet. Yet the dome to the faceplate male slash female attachment ring is of empire in styling. The interior is unfinished with no padding. The inner cross grills and eye lenses are correct to the final screen use version, although the outer dome's edge is thinner in width. There is no VAT on the hammer price on this lot. 15,000 to 20,000 pounds. So that's pretty awesome because it's basically been identified as an original production piece that was not um, used in filming. So it's, it's not exact to the finished pieces that was not filmed, but it was used during the production. So it's, it's, it sounds like a pretty interesting, piece and you know if you're a big star wars collector and you have no hope of ever owning a screen used darth vader helmet this might be something that would interest you because it's 
in appearance, you know, to the average person, even I wouldn't know looking at it, those, those differences that I just read about. And I've read a lot about Star Wars. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool that it's a production piece and it's not um, set with an astronomical estimate. So um, definitely a cover worthy piece. Hellraiser from Dusk Till Dawn. Now we're getting into the 80s cocoon, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Actually, I think I recognize these two thuggy gowns. Um, cocoon, Aliens. So there's obviously just a ton of material in this lot at a lot of different price points. So it's worth checking this catalog out because there could be some items from some obscure television show or film that you're into and it could be in this auction. So I would definitely take a close look at the, um, the full catalog. It's pretty interesting. Blade Runner. Absolutely fabulous. Con Air. Animal Farm. James Bond. Ooh, Die Hard. Die Hard with a Vengeance. Sorry, Die Hard always catches my attention. <laughs> um, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Batman and Robin, Evita, Exorcist 3, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Avengers, not the Marvel ones, Xena Warrior Princess, Starship Troopers, Eyes Wide Shut, The Shining, or Shining Through, I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep this video short. But there's a lot of pages. Starship Troopers. Dinosaurs. Batman Forever. Braveheart. Laura Croft. Tomb Raider. Sky High. Unbreakable. Gladiator, Sunshine, Rise of the Silver Surfer, 102 Dalmatians, Golden Compass, Italian Job, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Da Vinci Code, Avatar, Doctor Who. So that's it. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of material seems like the estimates are pretty reasonable. Um, you know, if you're into genre stuff from, I guess, the 60s all the way to the present, there's maybe something for you in this auction. So um, check it out. So this is kind of an unplanned part three of this video. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I wasn't familiar with this auction catalog before I um, started filming the video because I just thought it'd be more interesting if people got my first impressions of things. So having said that, when I read the Darth Vader catalog description for the helmet that's featured on the cover, I still had some questions, you know, kind of the most obvious one is, well, where did it come from? How did David get it? What's the background? Um, how do we know it's authentic apart from the unique kind of physical traits that are described in the catalog description? So after I filmed that, I reached out to David Oliver directly. Um, I explained to him what I'm doing at these videos at this point. As I'm filming this, no one even knows that I'm planning a YouTube um, channel. So I was kind of explaining to him, you know, that's what I'm doing and I'm um, taking kind of a different approach to it. And I have these questions about this Darth Vader helmet. And so he explained some more about the background of the piece. And then I said, you know, would you mind summarizing that in an email that I can then share with people as part of the video preview that I've put together? And he said, no problem. And that's what this email is. It's direct from David Oliver from Prop Masters. And I'm going to read it here. And um, there's some information that is included here that's in the, ca the catalog description, which we already read. But then it kind of fills in with some additional information, which I think would be helpful to people. So... 
Um, I'm going to start reading. I'm going to probably stop and pause and share some thoughts as I go along. So I'm using this pointer so you know what I'm reading. So it says, the Darth Vader helmet has a New Hope style front mask tells with an Empire Strikes Back style dome helmet fixing. It's the only known such example. And this is me interjecting. I haven't heard of an example like this, but it makes sense in the context of production that, you know, they were trying different things and, and this could be, you know, production kind of um, test. So back to reading. It says the dome helmet often suffered movement on A New Hope as it was mainly fixed by large Velcro pads from forehead to dome. Now I'm interjecting again. So I, I believe I remember seeing um, an example of an original authentic screen used Darth Vader helmet from A New Hope. And, you know, if, if this is the face mask and this is the dome where they overlap, there, I believe, was some Velcro padding here. So that was not a very sophisticated way, you know, to hold the pieces in place. But um, I didn't, I haven't looked at pictures to, to reaffirm this, but that's kind of what I remember. Um, from a past example of looking at, um, I think some official Star Wars book that maybe showed pictures or maybe something on the RPF or something, but that sounds really familiar to me. So now I'm going to go back to reading. So it says production resolved this by creating male to female integral attachment ring system from empire onwards. So this also sounds familiar and I believe I've seen, um, an original helmet example. So if this is the face plate, there's like a ring, not not to scale, obviously, on top. And then if this is the helmet part that goes over it, there's another ring interior. And so the two rings kind of fit into place. So that sounds really familiar. So I'm reading again. This helmet is transitional between the two. It was not screen used. So now I'm interjecting again. So that makes sense. It's kind of, um, this helmet sort of bridges that, um, those different styles, I guess you could say, but he wanted to emphasize that it's not screen used. It wasn't filmed. It wasn't worn on set. Um, it's a production piece that was not part of what we see on screen during either of the movies. So he wanted to make that really clear. I'm going back to reading now. It says differences being that the dome thickness is thinner, paint finish discrepancies, and no evidence of interior padding. And I'm interjecting now. Um, the padding would obviously indicate that it was um, intended to be worn because that would protect the actor's face. And he's saying this has no interior padding. So it's never um, contemplated that someone would wear this. Back to reading. It says, um, I acquired the helmet in the early to mid 1990s and it's been in my private collection ever since. It came from a family whose youngest son had been gifted it from a relative who worked on Star Wars at Elstree Studios. He had since grown up and was raising money for university, hence selling it. I used to have a store in Eggham, Surrey, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, close to the three main UK studios. And in response to wanted local advertising, the family walked in one day with a large carrier bag. So. Basically, David's saying he used to have a store near the studios where all these movies were made, um, and he used to put um, ads in local papers, for, you know, looking for movie props, costumes, things like that, because he was in such close proximity to the studios, people would respond to those ads and, and sell him things. So that's how it came into his possession in the early to mid-90s. So... Hopefully this um, is helpful to people. I just wanted to get a little bit more information to share and kind of memorialize before it goes under the hammer. And, um, you know, if people have additional questions, they can always reach out to David Oliver, just as I did. Um, he's super nice. He's always willing to um, engage in discussions about questions like these. And, you know, as I mentioned, this um, whole YouTube channel thing is new, so I'm kind of... Um, developing it as I go along. So this wasn't intended to be a three-part video, but this is, um, it won't be unusual because basically I'm going to try to always take a first look as the video. So you're going to get my first impressions. And, you know, with all these auctions, there's always things that jump out with questions and concerns and that require more information. And then, um, 
I'll always try to do that as time allows and I'll either add it to the video before it goes live or I'll publish subsequent follow-up videos with more information, more questions, etc. So that's um, that's basically it. Thanks for um, checking out this video. If you stuck through to the end, wow, thanks. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>